and welcome to this edition of Intelligent Video Today. I'm your host, Steve Onderhaar. Join us on the show this time, Colin Coyle, Senior Vice President of Sales over at High Vision. Welcome, Colin. Steve, thanks for having me today. Uh, happy to talk to you in these final days before the National Association of Broadcasters Conference in lovely Las Vegas. Big show coming up, absolutely. And uh, uh, people will be stopping by the booth wanting to learn a little bit more about High Vision. And uh, why don't you give them a preview of um, what High Vision is so they know uh, what's going on when they walk in. And uh, maybe uh, uh, give us a little chapter and verse on uh, what you folks are doing with Bonded Cellular Network. So that's awfully interesting yeah. stuff, too. So first off, I really appreciate the opportunity to come and talk with you and talk with uh, your audience today. Um, High Vision has been around for a while now, right? We've been, this is our 20th anniversary at this NAB. We're making a big deal of it. And um, the most important thing that I want to get out to people is we're not the same company we've been the last 20 years, right? We've done a lot of growth over the last few years, uh, organic and through acquisition. And you're going to see that on the show floor in Las Vegas. You're going to see the impact of our video wall processing technology. You can see the evolutions that we've made in video distribution. And we're really excited to really be bringing in this bonded video transmission, the bonded network transmission technology that we acquired uh, through Avi West, uh, actually a couple of NABs ago. So showing that product line really fully integrated with the larger uh, high vision product offering and bringing an impact to our customers who are looking to bring video from remote locations, from the field, back into their production workflows at the home network. So define for us what you mean by bonded cellular networks and how does it make a difference, uh, say, in network-constrained areas like uh, mobile mobile networks, for instance? Yeah. So network bonding is its not a new technology, right? It's not something that we just made last week. Uh, network bonding has been around for a while. You know, there's early iterations from mushroom networks aggregating USB modems, you know, 12, 15 years ago. Um, but the newest generation of bonding is really quite powerful. So we're looking at putting modems and network communications into these video transmitters, right? Which is an encoder that has the ability to send video back without being reliant otherwise on a, a network connection. And we can take multiple cellular radios inside that device. We can take external Wi-Fi radios. We can take uh, satellite pathways, we can take wired networks, and we can bond all of that together into either one large channel to give a real big fat pipe to get high quality video back from the field to home, or we can divide that into two redundant network channels that's going to bring your video back over two different combinations of networking technologies and network routes for that really important shot that it's okay if you lose a little bit of the quality so long as you've got the video where it's more important to be real time than it is to be high quality. And that's particularly the case in places like arenas and stadiums where you're getting a lot of people together and together for a live event. Uh, how, how do you see uh, your solution or the bonded cellular network solutions in general uh, helping organizations get the most out of uh, video in, in these uh, uh, very tightly constrained bandwidth areas? Yeah. So we're a really broad company, Steve, right? And we serve a lot of markets and we see uses for this technology across all of our markets, right? Uh, for those of the folks out there who are really more following the defense oriented markets, we're seeing really great developments with deployable 5G networks around training areas, right? Where law enforcement and military is getting together, setting up training zones in areas that don't normally have uh, existing network infrastructure. So you can rapidly deploy this bonded networking technology into the middle of uh, an empty space in Texas and run a public safety exercise with a network that didn't exist the day before, right? And we're gonna allow you to route that video within that exercise area back to that command environment in theater or back all that, bring it back to a point where there's a satellite connection, a satellite truck, a wired drop and bring it out to other locations. We see that same use, to your point, in stadiums, in large venues, especially as we move into things like the Democratic and Republican national conventions. Those are areas where you've got a lot of people in a small amount of space, where cellular 
typically starts to fail. Too many people in one spot overwhelming the local cells. The carriers do what they can to deploy extra resources and bring extra capacity in around those major events, but it's still kind of a best effort. We've seen a lot more venues in North America either uh, permanently installing private 5G networks within the stadium or the, the convention center or contracting with third parties to bring that temporary surge capacity in when there's really large events. So it's private network space. It's airspace that's reserved not for everyone's iPhones and Androids, but only for these video transmitters and other critical communications infrastructure. And that's going to have a big impact on content creators as well in these venues, right? Uh, uh, what are the implications of having more robust networks for acquisition in, this, uh, in these types of environments? Yeah, so it really leads to a broader range of technologies that can come to bear, right? You know, uh, just a couple of years ago, you had to have a broadcast camera that ran into the tens, sometimes with the right lenses, hundreds of thousands of dollars, depending on the type of shot that you wanted to line up and you wanted to do. It also made it really difficult to rapidly respond to changing conditions right? To be able to stand up more views, more angles, get more shots and cover the story in more ways. But combining the flexibility that folks like us and others in the space are bringing from hardware encoding, from bonded wireless transmission technologies, all the way down to the prosumer level, you know, really turning iPhones, Androids, tablets into near broadcast quality contribution devices, you're getting more devices covering the event from more angles using more network technologies to make sure that we're not stepping on each other's toes and everything uh, can get back to where it needs to, to that production studio at the enterprise headquarters for folks like Microsoft and Salesforce running these large scale events or to the media networks when they're covering public interest events. Now you say you're telling me that's more important to have these capabilities on hand in 2024 than any time before. Why is that the case? You know, we've seen the growth of citizen journalism over the years. And at first, I think folks inside our industry were throwing a little bit of dirt on them, right? The term prosumer used to have a pretty negative connotation, but uh, the advances in technology, the open source of things like High Vision's SRT protocol have really extended the technology tools to unlock the creativity of folks that are out there that are covering these things that are bringing their angles on these stories, you know, to the point where we have, if you come see us at NAB, right, um, we have the uh, France television built out a kit where it's using a mobile phone, it's relying on network bonding and our amazing Mojo Pro app, which can exist on the cellular network and external networks, but it's got a little mini Steadicam type rig in it. It's got a pro quality microphone. You're really able to cover more, a lot more cheaply, right? And as the world matures, technology matures, we start to see pressure from AI and other technologies that are trying to bring fake stuff into the world, the more that we can cover reality, the better it's going to be. And the more that we can open that up with our technology, the happier we are. Yeah, so we're getting uh, beyond these high profile uh, applications like in election reporting, for instance. Uh, how can we see this impacting corporations and businesses? How do you see uh, 5G capabilities impacting uh, that yeah. side of the video realm? You know, there's a number of ways, Steve. I mean, I've been a field engineer early in my career and I've worked on these types of corporate events where you know, for example, the hotel internet is garbage, right? You've got a keynote speech, you wanna get it out to the world and you can't rely on the network drop that's in the room. And for a long time, that meant renting dedicated fiber. That meant spending money to have a satellite truck outside the building. Uh, but as cities in the United States begin to catch up with our counterparts in Europe and deploy more public infrastructure in 5G. Um, we've already seen it with LTE, but 5G is gonna open up so much more bandwidth and so much more possibility that we can aggregate together the capability of the public network 
with that wired connection that's usually pretty reliable, but a bit suspect, and a bit more affordable satellite technologies like Starlink. There's so much changing, Steve, in network capacity and the delivery mechanisms that are available to everyone. Having flexibility is the key. So in your corporate go kit, your public affairs kit, where you're following the CEO around, you don't have to worry, is this worth going live? It's going to cost me $1,000 for every 30 minutes. You can say, I'm going to use the right networks wherever I happen to be with this executive to get the story back to reach my people. It's not even about reaching the outside world, right? We've learned through the pandemic, the level executives are expected to communicate with their staff, right? With this distributed workforces. Um, it's more significant than ever before. And we're really opening a lot of that up with our tools. So when you have uh, bigger, fatter, better networks, it, it always leads itself or lends itself to new use cases, new applications. Uh, how do you see uh, the availability of greater network capacity ultimately impacting yeah. uh, the content of uh, the content and uh, capture of content and, and other video uh, at the edge? In a lot of ways, I see having the ability to aggregate, the ability to deliver over broader, more capable networks as really just opening up more of the network for other uses, right? In the world of broadcast video, we're seeing a lot of adoption of SMPTE 2110, right? We're seeing a continued expansion of other network and video delivery technologies. And those are very high bandwidth, right? They need a lot of bandwidth to deliver either uncompressed or lossless compressed video technology, right? And not every piece of video coming from the field needs to be lossless 4K archival quality. So our goal is to deliver as much video as we can with the right amount of bandwidth, the right amount of criticality to meet its exact need, right? That's what we learned through SRT, right? Where we've got this protocol that allows you to flexibly decide delivery is more important or security is more important. Bandwidth is more important or latency is more important. And we're bringing that same degree of flexibility into these broader, more flexible networks. So lots of interesting things to talk about at the NAB show uh, coming up next week. Where can people find you on the show floor? Yeah, so we're going to be in the West Hall at booth 2612. The West Hall is that beautiful new hall uh, that they've opened across the street from the main convention center. Uh, we'd love to see you there. Come on by, visit High Vision. You can see all of our technology at work, including some new stuff that uh, we won't be ready to talk about for another four days, according to my watch right now. Well, we'll be anxiously looking for the news announcements coming out of High Vision, and uh, good luck to you at the show. Colin Coyle, thanks so much for taking the time to visit us uh, today on Intelligent Video Today. Thanks for having me today, Steve. And our thanks goes out to you for watching today's episode. Be sure to click on the link right below there to get access to the Intelligent Video Today channel on YouTube to get access to more insight about the intelligent video landscape from industry thought leaders like Colin Coyle. For Intelligent Research and Intelligent Video Today, I'm Steve Underhar. Thanks for your time.